Carol, <laughs> those who are listening at home, hello and, and welcome to Journalism on Film, The Good, the Bad, and the Obscure, a webinar hosted by the Society of Professional Journalists. I'm Lou Harry, editor of Quill, SBJ's magazine, and quillmag.com. A little bit of background. In 2019, we celebrated SPJ's 110th anniversary, and one of the features we created for Quill was a ranked critical guide to 110 journalism movies. Uh, to make it somewhat manageable, we limited it to English language feature films released in theaters, uh, not documentaries. Mm -hmm. Uh, for help, I recruited from Midwest Film Journal, a website where I occasionally contribute, uh, some critics there. Uh, and the full epic feature, which clocked in at about 14,000 words, has proved to be the most clicked story in Quill Mag history. We've added and will continue to add uh, reviews to that story. Uh, it's now 110 plus journalism movies ranked. Uh, with most of us sequestered in our homes, many uh, with more movie watching time than we had before, this seemed like a good opportunity to continue that conversation and welcome some additional voices into the mix, hence our panel today. Uh, first, Carol Horst, Managing Editor, uh, Features for Variety, the Bible of the showbiz industry. She's worked on Variety Hi. dailies for the uh, Cannes, Berlin, Venice, and Toronto Film Festivals, as well as Hong Kong's Film Art and the American Film Market. Welcome, Carol. Hi, how are you? Good, good, good. <laughs> uh, Michael Phillips is the <laughs> film critic, previously wrote about theater, movies, and arts for, and culture for the Los Angeles Times and other outlets. He has taught cinema studies and arts journalism around the nation and guest hosts film spotting on Chicago Public Radio. And we have Nick Rogers, co-founder and co-editor of uh, Midwest Film Journal, one of the main contributors to the Quill story. Nick is a member of the Indiana Film Journalists Association and has commented on film for Playboy, National Syndicates, and a long list of newspapers. Welcome all, and welcome those Hello. who are you are welcome Hello. to talk with questions um, uh, in the chat area. Uh, let's let's dive right in. Uh, obviously, movies don't have to be grounded in reality. That's not what they always do. But which movies <laughs> have each of you seen that are the most realistic about the work of journalists? Carol, do you want to get us started with where do you think, uh, which has felt most realistic to you? Well, I mean, you know, I think the number one is, is Spotlight. Um, to me, that was uh, most grounded in what happens in a newsroom, the dialogue. Um, and also, even though it's set up as a tense 70s thriller, is all the president's men. Mm -hmm. The way the editor, because I'm an editor, I enjoy telling writers what to do. And <laughs> <laughs> Ben Bradley is, I get that, you know, and he, he, he pokes at them, he tells them what to do, he gives them somewhat parameters. Um, but I feel like that newsroom setting was more, was, you know, fairly realistic given the constraints of, you know, the thriller setup and, mm -hmm. and the tenseness of it. Do you have a pre preference for which Ben Bradley you like? Uh, <laughs> Hanks and the post? Jason Robart. Uh, Jason Robards is sexy. I'm sorry. He's... <laughs> Very sexy dude. Um, a drunk, I get it, but you know, <laughs> he, I like those, I like those bad boys. I don't know. I was a kid in the seventies. <laughs> Things stick with you. <laughs> Michael, are there others? Uh, I mean, those are two that get cited very often for their right. realism. Are there others that you uh, would add to that? Well, I was going to say too before we, before we let it go. I think Carol. I, I think all the President's Men may be the only movie where like where. Uh, you know, uh, straight women and, and homosexual men have a real range of sexy men to choose from. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, Dennis, uh, Dustin Hoffman's hair was amazing <laughs> in that movie. I What's amazing it. is that the hair, the hair in that movie is basically a pandemic uh, lockdown hair. <laughs> so, Come back around to being in fashion again. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. right. I'm totally with you on Spotlight, uh, Carol. I, I we we just saw that the other night, uh, and again, and it's. I was surprised how much better it is. I think at the at the, mm. at the tone and the particulars of journalism gathering, news gathering, uh, than all the president's men, which I think is great fun and and really uh, really an amazingly densely packed achievement. All the president's men. I haven't seen it for a few years, but. You know, that's a different kind of, uh, of sure. 
flick. You know, you got huge stars and William Goldman, who, you know, writes dialogue like nobody else and not necessarily like journalists even talk, but it's a pleasure to hear. I, but I'm with you, Lou. I, I don't have a, you know, realism is not necessary. The lack of realism is not what sunk <laughs> Richard Jewell as a movie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the flagrant lack of realism in, in the in the female reporter uh, in the inventions and you know fabrication typical percentage of fabrication in Richard Jewell the Clint Eastwood film mm -hmm. uh, it's not it's not like it made up stuff to a greater degree than most newspaper movies do it's mm -hmm. just that the film wasn't really working that well beyond mm -hmm. that issue of the Olivia, Olivia Wilde character, so that suddenly you just couldn't help but focus on uh, the truth or the fiction of what what that character does in the in the service of that version of the story. But so, that character obviously got into the the you know, it was the caraway seed that got stuck in the teeth of most journalists watching <laughs> that movie. Yeah, I mean, I I, I don't want to go. There's so much. <laughs> Sure you do. Female, <laughs> female Sarah, reporters. Sarah. Okay, journalism movies with female reporters are always are always so so fraught with peril for a woman watching these movies. Uh, it just it's crazy. I mean, my workplace is full of people saying things that would get sent you sent to HR if you were in like Procter and Gamble, but we're yeah. journalists and we're like, haha, and, and we get it. But it, it's like, oh my God, to see it on screen. Oh, it just, it just drives me nuts. Well, one of the ones that got a, a lot of heat back in the day, I'm not sure if it's still on the radar, but Up Close and Personal, which was allegedly a biographical <laughs> film about Jessica Savage, which oh, became yeah. a long time. That's uh, right. Nick, have you seen, was that on your viewing lineup? Um, no, I, I think I, I, somebody else drew the short straw, I think, on that one from the, from the, uh, the Midwest Film Journal team. I, I've, I've not seen uh, Up Close and Personal, but I know of its reputation, certainly, as a, as a, um, a, a huge liberty taken with Jessica Savage's story. Um, I, I think, you know, Carol, Carol and Michael both raised great points about, about Richard Jewell. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, we, could, we could probably have an entire... Um, you know, webinar offshoot from from that in and of itself. Um, one of the one of the things, um, obviously, the 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 movies brought up uh, already. Um, you know, are, are sterling examples. I, I think of, of good realism. And one of the things that that jumped out for me, maybe less of the the hard news and the urgency um, side, was uh, the end of the tour. Um, mm. If if for for anyone who has ever done a profile. Of, of, right. any, of any uh, length or scope that, that pursuit of the kind of the golden question or the, or the mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the insight that the person you're writing about has, has not considered in a certain way. That, that entire movie takes that and kind of turns it into sort of an existential treatise on that, on, on yeah. that, that pursuit. And so I think that that's another movie that, that among those, the, those the best ones on this list, I think, mm. um, you know, kind of, kind of jumps out as a, as a certain set of realism uh, yeah. for me on the, on the opposite side of the, of the, the writing. And that, that moment movie. is, I think, important in there. And it's one of the things that I know people love, especially male writers tend to love Almost Famous. Um, and one oh. of the things that bothered me about that movie was the editor insisting, oh, you need to have the interview with him. You need to get the interview. Whereas that reporter saw so much and would have such a great story, didn't need the interview. Yeah, uh, right. That was one where right. being a journalist got in the way of me enjoying the movie perhaps as much as I should have. Um, most, I, I hope you've at least taken a look at the list. Is, are there films that you think are underrated in the genre that you think should uh, you know, somebody should consider taking a look at this weekend. It might not be the obvious ones, like all the President's Men, Spotlight, His Girl Fridays, <laughs> Jason Kane. Um, well, go ahead. Sorry. I, I was just going to say, I, I just rewatched To Die For uh, the other day. And even though that's not high on, it's kind of high on the list, what it, it shows me is it's a prototypical Fox News woman. Um, Nicole Kidman's character, uh, Suzanne Stone, 
should she had, if she had continued on, then she would have been on Fox News, which uh, this movie came out a year before Fox News launched. And the, and seeing it at the time, I remember seeing it like, oh, this, I love this movie. I, I thought it was a lot of fun and real interesting and everybody's great in it. But now with the perspective of distance and what we've seen over the last 20 plus years of what's happened to our media, I'm just like, whoa, I was, if, if you look at it in a different point of view, I thought that was interesting. I just saw it from a whole different angle. The film held up well for you? Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. But Nicole I Kidman's agree. great. More troubling than it, than it seemed initially, maybe, right? I mean, just because the world sort of caught up with it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I don't have any problem. I, I, I think, uh, I forget how far, uh, how high up in the pole Lou was Ace in the Hole. I Ace in the Hole was pretty, uh, definitely 13. in the top. 13, number 13. 13. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I mean, it's part of, it's, it's not really new. You know that's the one newspaper film, but there's there's three movies set in the '50s that I really think work great as a trio of of kind of media critique, and it's you know Ace in the Hole, A Face in the Crowd, and Sweet Smell of Success. And yeah. Sweet Smell of Success, I, I think, is a stunningly good dialogue and a really merciless portrayal of that Winchell-like character that Burt. Mm -hmm. The movie's not perfect, but um, I mean, I, I liked I like the genre unapologetically for for the bullshit as much as I like it for the realism. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I just love comparing His Girl Friday adaptations, you know, I mean, and, and uh, you can't beat, you can't beat His Girl Friday based on the, you know, uh, right. in terms of the front page adaptation. <laughs> I, all of them, the, the, the films that Lee Tracy made, uh, the actor Lee Tracy, not well known, made in the, especially in the early 30s, where he always played a incredibly fast talking, unscrupulous gossip column. It's like in the blessed, <laughs> it's a film called Blessed Event. And just to see how an actor who was originally, I think he was the original Hildy Johnson on mm -hmm. stage in the front page back in 25 or whatever. Um, he's the, he is the guy. I mean, that's like, he's like the El Dorado of, of the <laughs> characters. He, once you find him, you explains everything, you know? And um, I don't know, you see those films and then you see a, a, a pretender kind of screwball newspaper romance like I Love Trouble. Mm -hmm. oh, God. <laughs> I'm on the list. And, and it's, a, it's a good reminder on how, you, you know, it, the odds against success are always bigger than the odds against failure. Right. And, yeah, coming up with that, speaking of on the comedy side of it, it's interesting because one of the ones that if we were having this discussion in 1930, you mentioned the front page, that was considered a gritty, you know, look behind the curtain of what it's like, <laughs> in a, you know, in a, uh, not a newsroom, but a, you know. Right. In bed right. In um, and now it's sort of history. And what we see from the perception of journalists in different movies, watching Teacher's Pet was interesting <laughs> to me because I, it hadn't dawned on me how much, of a split, at least that movie presents, and maybe it was reality, of the career journalists who like went right out of high school into journalism versus the academics, with Doris Day <laughs> representing those who actually study journalism, uh, which seems to not be a major issue given that most journalists now probably have gone through J school. Right. Are there right. Are on the list that, uh, that you think deserve more attention than they've gotten? Um, well, somebody mentioned it in the chat, so so I know I at least have an ally there. I saw it pop up very briefly in the window. Um, not the not one of the you know kind of unsung greats, but I think sort of an unsung solid movie is uh, is a movie from two thousand eight called Nothing But the Truth. Um, it's a movie that that Rod Lurie uh, did um, back when you know wild politically speculative fantasy seemed like you know uh, escapist entertainment, right? Um, you know, it, it's kind of inspired by the Judith Miller Valerie Plain uh, controversy. Um, kind of an unexpectedly great turn from Kate Beckinsale uh, in that movie, and not an actress that you would would associate necessarily with, um, you know, this genre or even or even um, you know a, a kind of a, a, a standout performance in within that genre. But um, uh, kind of a, a a strong, entertaining, kind of pulpy enough rumination on on First Amendment attacks and 
and governmental accountability. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I would recommend that. I don't, I don't know offhand if it's streaming on any um, subscription service or not. Um, but uh, the other one I would say that you know is is certainly better known or better regarded, but maybe you know um, people have forgotten about it a little bit. Uh, is the Insider? Uh, that was a film that I had oh, not. That was good. Uh, oh, yeah. The Insider was a was a film that I had not seen in many years prior to revisiting it for this project. And I was stunned by um, just how well that has uh, held up, not just as a, you know, as a, as a story of, of journalism, but kind of within Michael Mann's overall, uh, uh, overall work. I mean, it's very much the outlier in that it's not about physical violence, but um, that that menace and that threat uh, is, still, is still very prevalent in the visuals of that film. And I, so I would, I recommend if it's been a while since you've seen The Insider or if you happen to uh -huh. have not seen it, um, you strongly recommend uh, trying to seek that one out. Mentioning some comedies that probably have the deepest penetration among people, things like, like Anchorman and Groundhog Day, in addition to being entertaining, is there something to, to take away from those about journalism or is it just cartoon fun? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I go ahead. Oh, I was going to say so. So many of these uh, movies that have journalists front and center, like Anchorman. I mean, they're they're like uh, they're there because it's it's a good way for a screenwriter to construct getting some character access to a TV studio or this or that. Um, so many, I don't. So many movies with women. It's like a good job for a woman character. Just like a, you know, she'd be a gallery owner or a journalist, or it's just like yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she could get into parties and you know, mm -hmm. be Carrie Bradshaw, and it's just easy to write scenarios around a character like that. Um, so there's that distinction on this list of like someone like Hildy Johnson and His Girl Friday, who is like, I've met people like who are just consumed by it's it's. I've had to, I have issues with that movie, but she is so consumed by her job and what she wants and being a journalist. It's different than mm -hmm. just Ron Burgundy. I, I mean, obviously, sure. who's who's on TV because they like to be famous. I mean, I liked Anchorman. I thought it was funny, but yeah. um, Hildy Johnson may be a good transition <laughs> to broadcast news. Oh, I love that movie. News is holding up. Which. That was that was our I think it was probably our biggest bone of contention in this list. Lou was the ranking for broadcast news. There was a lot of debate and discussion. Yeah, there was a lot of debate and discussion. It ended up at, at number thirty-eight, which which seems almost unfathomable to me. But we we won't bore people with the inside baseball back and forth on that. I, I mean, I, I think that's just that's a terrific movie that I think has also, despite some of the trappings of the era in which it was made, has held up um, tremendously mm -hmm. well as as a story of of you know values and vanity within um you know within the business uh, uh you know certainly uh, you know i i would personally put that one higher i mean i can understand you know you could we could we could have any any number of of back and forth for you know where it landed but um you know mm -hmm. that that's a that's another one um uh, you know that's really strong on the list yeah. for me i guess as far as as other comedies go probably on this list the one that comes closest to actual journalism might be borat um, uh, in, in, the, in the, in the, you know, certainly in a, in a muckraking sense, I guess, but, mm -hmm. you know, certainly, certainly in a, uh, quasi documentary sense, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the verite aspect of it, um, you know, it, it is in its own way, you know, somewhat of an act of journalism about how, how people want the USA to be seen and how the USA is actually seen uh in the world in, in a lot of ways so um it's funny because that that film came out was i was really hot for it when it came out and, and it's by far uh, uh sasha baron cohen's best film by a mile oh, and yeah. uh mm -hmm. it came out at, at a time that seems so uh, starkly divided with 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 the uh, you know iraq war and and just sort of the american patriotic those at home and the rest of it and now with with the trump administration it just seems like that's just such a pussycat of a movie now you know <laughs> you know that's another one where life life has sort of overtaken it and um you know one, one film I, I i wanted to stick up for just it, it's incredibly minor but i really enjoyed it and it was very influential for me at 16 years old 
was between the lines. The oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love it. And anybody who's my, my first full time job was at the weekly in Minneapolis city pages. And it was always about to go under. And, uh, you know, um, it, uh, to me is, as, as kind of soft and romantic as a lot of it is, and there's barely a plot. It's just kind of stunningly good company to sit around with Jeff Goldblum as this kind of stoner rock critic and all. And actually, the women's scenes are really good. I think they're not really particularly well written, but the way Silver, the director, Joe McLean Silver, directs Lindsay Krauss and Jill Eikenberry, and those scenes really have something. And it's the kind of relaxed investigation of a little bit of character in the middle of a, um, you know, a, a small but really, really. I think a pungent movie about about trying to hang on to your ideals, and this is a big '70s thing anyway. About like how how do you hang on to your ideals if the once once the '60s are gone? And, um, a rare film about an alt weekly when we're talking about the <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Actually, you know written by a guy who worked for um, for uh, uh, not the Phoenix but the other one I forget <laughs> yeah. um, in Boston. So you know it had a little it had it had a little something to it. I mm -hmm. thought. Well, who else is, has anybody not seen that film? A terrific movie. I think oh. I saw it in college a hundred thousand years ago. <laughs> Two films that have been brought up uh, in the chat, which are, that are outstanding and ended up high on our list, uh, are Shattered Glass and yeah. Zodiac. Both, both that sort of show the the challenges and the difficulties, I think, of accurately reporting yeah. Stories. I think in a way they kind of go together. Anyone want to talk a little bit about Zodiac? Uh, I tried to rewatch that because mm -hmm. I thought it was, uh, I love David Fincher movies, it, but it scared me. It was mm -hmm. so brutal mm -hmm. uh, that I just, I'm like, I can't revisit that. Yeah. But yeah, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it, yeah. Anyway, I, mean, anyway I, <laughs> I, I remember it being very brutal and very honest and very scary. One of the few that seems to be about the fact that we may not be able to figure out the truth. Right. That it's yeah, not, that's that's yeah. not an automatic ending. And, and I, think, I think at least for journalists, you know, in, in part, you know, and certainly for, for other, you know, everyday audience members, I think that that movie feeds off of that specific part of the anxiety of the pursuit, right? Of not finding that answer. The anxiety, the anxiety that nothing is at the end of everything that you're doing, that, you know, your compulsions and your, and your, your you know, your territorial fights, as there are many in that, in that movie, just ultimately amount to, you know, what other parts of your life you've lost to that, you know, kind of that mad mm -hmm. pursuit. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think, um, you know, if, if we were doing sort of an individual top five, Zodiac would definitely be in there for me. Um, you know, I, it's not an easy watch. Um, you know, uh, Carol is, is, is correct on that. It's, it's not something that you want to revisit very often because it very much sucks you into that, that mm -hmm. feeling and that, and that mood. Mm -hmm. Michael, is, uh, have you run into characters like those in Shattered Glass? <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, uh, total weasels, yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, I'd like to say one more thing about Zodiac. The sure. one thing, I find that film terrific. And it's because of that, uh, that really challenging, unresolved ending. And, mm -hmm. and just this pursuit that goes in circles. It's, it's an amazingly um, uncommercial picture. I mean, I, mean, mm -hmm. I, I always, I always I, you can point to how that film did overseas, where in countries like France and you know, a lot of Scandinavia where they would maybe, maybe more historically be willing to sit with a really difficult movie with big stars and has sort of a commercial patina, but really it just doesn't deliver any of that story that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. If you're just a general audience member, it tanked everywhere. Nobody saw that. Yeah. Film. It just didn't work. And it's such a good movie. It's always, bugged, it's always bugged me because at the time Fincher said, to, to some interview where he said, he said, if, I, if, if I've done this right, this will be the last serial killer movie anybody has to make. And mm -hmm. it's been so disheartening for me to see him just sort of revisit that, that, uh, that world in a much, you know, kind of slicker, more palatable and totally grisly fashion and things like The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and all. And, and those movies are just, uh, you know, I think they're just, 
they're beautifully made and sort of shallow and Zodiac just feels like it's a grown up movie. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's yeah. go to Shattered Glass then, which I know that uh, of journalism teachers that I know, many of them have used that in classes because, you know, journal, it's very, can be easy and tempting for a journalist mm -hmm. to shade the truth, uh, yep. to clean up a quote, to yeah. start to slide down that slope. Um, I'll just other, say, I haven't seen it in a long time. I want to hear what, what others, uh, what, what the others have to say about it. But I, I, I think it, 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 I did a, U, a USC NEA Arts Journalism Fellowship and we did a, a few years ago at, at USC and, uh, and the most fruitful discussion and really the most arresting discussion we had, it was about 15 people, some just out of college, a lot of mid-career journalists. We all, we got on this topic sort of impromptu about um, ethical dilemmas, conflicts mm -hmm. of interest, things like that. And everybody's stories were so radically different and everybody's yardsticks were kind of mm -hmm. uh, very different from their, their neighbors, depending on what job they had, what part of the, what part of what city they did the job in. Uh, it was it was alarming how little objective um, uh, agreement there was about what does or doesn't cross an ethical uh, mm -hmm. journalistic line. So I, a film like Shattered Glass is great. Uh, it's good on its own. It's great discussion fodder, as you say. Other thoughts on that one? I, I recommended that to my daughters. Oh, I just recommended it to my kids because we were rewatching all the Star Wars movies. And I'm like, Hayden Christensen actually is very good in this movie. <laughs> they didn't yeah. believe me. They didn't <laughs> believe me that he could act. And I'm like, well, yeah, he's very good in that. Mm -hmm. um, um, other favorites that are popping up in the, uh, in the chat include The Paper, which um, I think for some has that ensemble feel that, that some folks sort of find pleasure in from for a newspaper film, the idea of all these different personalities working together, is that, do you think that is uh, one that deserves the love that it gets? Nick? I, I, I mean, I enjoy that movie. I, I probably, I'm, I'm good with where it's at in the list. I feel it's, it's, it's uh, you know, to me, it's not too high or too low. I mean, I, I think that movie definitely knows that it is tweaking the conventions of the, the movie genre as much as it is uh, the, the job itself. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's readily apparent throughout, but it's, but it's, you know, the, 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 the press stopping moment where they comment on, you mm -hmm. know, I've always wanted to say that. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's in as much a, a Valentine to the journalism movie as it is to, you mm -hmm. know, the, the camaraderie and the spirit of a newsroom, you know, great withering lines about columnists in there too. Um, you know, just good inside baseball stuff that, that we can all laugh at. I think that, you know, it definitely has that commercial, bouncy, Ron Howard feel to it. It's it's not a classic. I don't think it's even Ron Howard's best movie about journalism. I would put Frost Nixon above it. Um, but but it, but it, but it's still I, I I like the paper. I think I think it, its place on this list is is warranted, and you know where it's at. I, I think that movie holds up as as a piece of entertainment, if nothing else. And all of you write and have written criticism. Do you think that the the way that critics are portrayed in movies has sort of hurt the reputation of those in the, in the job. I'm thinking <laughs> something like- Having worked with many critics, no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's hey, it. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting out of this Zoom. Yeah, um, all about, the I just watched it all about Eve again, speaking oh, of critics. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway. Right. I, the uh, or Lady in the Water, right? With uh, where, the, where the critic is is one of the the most violently hacked apart victims mm -hmm. in that movie. Um, M Night Shyamalan film from from maybe yeah. about fifteen years right. ago with with Paul Giamatti. Um, about fifteen people saw in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> one of them, yeah. I feel that right. critics, you know, okay, I, I can joke about critics, and because I work with so many of them at Variety and have worked with amazing critics, um, including Todd McCarthy and Justin Chang at the LA Times. And I feel that making fun of them and being them figures of fun or backbiting or just, you know, the, the George Sanders kind of like guy, mm -hmm. 
I feel that really hurts the arts. I feel, I feel that really hurts the arts. I feel like really smart criticism is so valuable to, and, and to make these people cardboard figures of fun. It, it just does a disservice to real critics who are so thoughtful and so smart and just add so much to a film goers or TV viewers experience. You watch something and then you turn to say my colleague, Peter DeBruge at Variety and like, oh, wow, that's interesting. And, mm. and it, I feel, I mean, I, I feel like I'm on a high horse right now, but I do feel it does hurt um, the critics, especially critics are always the first to be cut now, it seems at news organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and I know at Variety, we have cut down and all, publications have cut down on their critics, uh, their budgets for critics. And I feel that really is, does a disservice. But I, I think too, it, it also kind of gets at an underpinning where we're at now with it weakens people's willingness to consider an opinion that diverges from theirs if it's well mm. reasoned and, and well thought out. I mean, I, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's a movie. You could say that. I mean, it's just somebody's thoughts on a movie, but I think, you know, all of those little, all of those little cuts add up to, you know, I mean, it can be a pretty cumulative disconnect between, well, you know, um, you know, that person's just a critic. They don't agree, you know, because they don't agree with me. Um, right. You know, I, I think that that's also dangerous and that's dangerous well beyond the field of, of the arts too. I, I think that, you know, that kind of discourse when it's, when it's not an attack on somebody, when it's, you know, when it's a, um, you know, well thought out argument, um, you know, I think some of that art of, you know, spirited and, and collegial discussion and debate is gone. Um, hmm. Yeah, I think it, I, I mean, I, I've, I've done it at six different papers, you know, either for writing mostly about theater or film, depending. And it, it I, I think there are, I mean, the dumbest critics I know are the ones the, who are the most insular and kind of ivory tower and never do any other kind of writing or don't they don't spend their time doing anything except sort of halfway up their own mm -hmm. and you know, it's, a, it's a different i'm not I, i'm not a reporter by nature but I, I i you know i had to do a certain amount of reporting like most critics uh, by necessity mm -hmm. on the beat and and then there's you know the, every kind of profile and commentary and obituary and all of it and it's it's all at the end of a year you tend to look at what you've accomplished is you know it's and it's, if you have, if you're fortunate enough to have a job that, um, at a paper that still values criticism to some degree, you're still doing the majority of your time is spent mostly what you what you'd love to do. Mm -hmm. but the rest of it is also great. Uh, um, it's it's like continuing education for you, and it's just better for the paper to have you know a certain amount of versatility going on. Just like we've all had to, you know, deal with more than one um, medium. In, in recent years, we, we have to, and we should. Um, I don't know, I, I love, uh, um, you know, I, I love the old, you know, I, I, the fact that movies as good as Laura, mm -hmm. Clifton Webb typing in the tub, uh, and, and All About Eve with George Sanders, as you mentioned, and, and, and as good as Ratatouille, frankly, mm -hmm. Anton. Oh. <laughs> the fact mm -hmm. that those films of that quality, very different, all of them, you know, it, going for this a similar stereotype or archetype of the critic, it's bailed out, I think, by the quality of the writing and, and mm. the acting, frankly. But I see a movie that's, you know, that's okay, but much more heavy handed, I think, like Birdman, where that mm. scene with the critic, where Michael yeah. Keaton, you know, has to it basically gets chewed apart slowly, mm. quietly at the bar by um, uh, the drama critic played by, and I'm forgetting her name, with an excellent actress, shoot. Uh, and Birdman, who, who does that scene? That's yeah. all blanking. I know, I cannot remember I'm, it. I'm on it, I'll find it in a second. All right, good, good. good, good. Um, you know, that scene, I thought that, that gets to more what Carol's mm -hmm. talking about, I think, for me. Just that it, it's, it, in, way, in a way, that scene is dead serious about the worthlessness of, of uh, critical voice. And, uh, you know, I, that movie's diverting enough at its best, just because it's always on the move and it's got you know an interesting look and mm -hmm. all the rest of it. But I, I find it I find it you know useless on that stuff. <laughs> uh, Lindsay Duncan. 
Lindsay Duncan. Uh, you know, oh, yeah. I do not blame the actors. I always say with movies, <laughs> everything, has chance, everything has a chance to go wrong before anyone gets to the set and then says, you know, action. So yeah, I, th I blame the writing there. Somebody mentioned uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas saying that um, they were disappointed that it was so low on the list because Hunter S. Thompson's influence should have bumped it up a few notches. How much do you give sort of extra credit for either something that's original uh, or let you know less seen or something that uh, is revealing something new or in other cases has its heart in the right place? Do you factor those intentions and uniqueness in when you're uh, assessing a film? Do I know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It, it, um, it's, it's always worth talking about what the intentions probably were. You don't know, mm -hmm. uh, but it's worth talking about it. And then it's worth talking about what the results, you know, turned out to be. Um, you know, directors can shoot scripts that, that read funny and, and then suddenly, or, or a certain speed. My favorite example on that front is, not a journalism movie, but it's the social network where mm -hmm. Aaron Sorkin's script, if you gave it to Ron Howard, for example, you know, it would, it would be, it would feel very, it wouldn't necessarily be an unsuccessful film and I've been more commercially successful, but you know, Fincher shoots it like there's a serial killer around every corner mm -hmm. and our, the entire Harvard campus is lit by 40 watt bulbs. <laughs> you know, it's, got, it's got a certain overlay of, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, sinister, a morality to it. Interesting contrast, but um, I, I, you know, on intentions, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I think Richard Jewell may have not, may not have wanted to to turn the rep, the reporter mm -hmm. into a voracious, almost subhuman individual. But it sure as hell turned out that way. So I don't really, yeah. you know, do you need to add that uh, that qualifier in the sentence? I I, I don't know. Right. I saw the movie. I saw that movie twice to try to figure out exactly where it went wrong with that character. And it, there's nothing right with the way they they handle it. And um, so I, I think intentions are pleasant but uh, irrelevant. <laughs> And I, I know some of the some of the authors, some of the fellow authors of the piece are weighing in too in the chat uh, in in some places. So some of the folks that that wrote about some of these movies that aren't on the on the panel are are weighing in in the chat uh, as well. So Excellent. another another brought up the China Syndrome. Has anyone watched that movie in the last couple of decades? But obviously had a major influence yeah, at the time. Nick, yeah. how's it feel? Um, I, you know, I, I think that there's, again, kind of like broadcast news, there's still some trappings of the era in that film, for sure. Um, but I think that movie, um, I think the message of that movie is that if people are going to insist that, that corporations are people too, some of those, a good deal of those people are bastards. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's a, that's a, um, that's a message that I think still rings quite loudly and with a lot of truth, um, you know today and through other, you know, crises that, that, that we've faced. And, and, um, you know, that movie certainly plays up, you know, the, the thriller aspect of it, um, you know, the ticking clock aspect of it. But I think that there's still, um, I, I think that when a movie can express its righteous anger on that side of things, you know, in, in, in as much as, you know, the journalism movie is going to throw, um, objectivity out the window almost every time. Um, you know, I, I think that that movie is effective at least in making that anger feel analogous to something happening now. Mm -hmm. um, you can look at it and say, you know, it's sad that things haven't changed much or, you know, I feel that way now about X or Y. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You know, the, obviously the elephant in the room is that we are, have a limited amount of films being released. Film, more people are watching films at home I'm curious about where, how that has impacted your work. Um, not necessarily talking about journalism movies, but about journalists trying to cover movies. Uh, Carol, what's what's work life like at Variety now? It's um, it's lived on online, on Zoom, on High Five, on <laughs> any number of uh, of conference calls, but um, people. 
people seem happy to talk. People want to reach out um, and talk about what's going on out there. And um, it it feels like it feels like for me things haven't been haven't changed too much except for now instead of can the can film festival and getting ready for can we're talking about the can virtual market that's coming up in june mm -hmm. um and that's a lot of stuff up in the air um i think the exhibition business is freaking out um little exhibitor music box um you know draft house cinema these smaller exhibitors of, of specialty and art house movies are they've come up with online streaming partnerships uh they get some revenue and it's great and and it's great for people to go online and see these wonderful movies that people had seen in film festivals last year i think that's really important for these smaller movies to get traction that way um but these big exhibitors um they're freaking out and rightly so because people don't know are you going to is it going to be the norm to watch trolls at home? Are they going to do a day and dates with video, with online releases and releases at theaters? Because people still want to go see these big blockbusters in a movie theater. Um, a couple years ago, somebody predicted that. It's just going to be this bifurcation. It's going to be your Star Wars, your Marvel Cinematic Universe, your DC in movie theaters because people like to share that experience. And then everything else is is online. Um, I don't know. It, it seems like right now that's the way it might be. I hope not. Um, it's still fun to go see. I went to see Emma right before everything closed down in a movie theater, and it was amazing because it was full. We all enjoyed it. It was a shared experience. It wasn't lonely, and that's that's another thing is that shared experience. I think people are gonna just balance. You can stay home because you don't wanna get a babysitter and watch Emma, or you could go get the babysitter and go see Emma. I, I, I don't think there's this doom and gloom, but um, right now everything is so up in the air, it's even hard to say any a prediction of anything. Yeah, um, Rebecca, what are you seeing? I'm sorry, is that for me? Yeah, I'll just ask you what yeah, you're Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I, I mean, there's a lot to write about. Uh, oh yeah, about a lot of the reasons Carol's mentioned. I mean, I mean, the music box is here in Chicago, and they, you know, every every all the major uh, sort of specialty and art house uh, venues, uh, music box, uh, the Cisco Film Center, Facets, they all have uh, they all have these programs where it's a fifty fifty split with the distributor, and you know, it's a little money for everybody, and you know, you, you, they they don't make a lot, but it keeps the work somewhat uh, in the in the conversation my own job has been completely yoinked around because we're all doing all kinds of coronavirus coverage and i'm on i'm one of a dozen or 15 people on the obituary team because we're trying to write a, a, a selection that we can't be comprehensive mm -hmm. selection of uh, obits not really standard obits but you know obituary type tributes to various folks who have passed away uh, in the pandemic in the Chicago area. And it's, you know, it's a hundred and some a day and you only get to a fraction, but you know, that's, uh, that's, I've written obituaries, but not like, uh, not, not as a matter of course before and not off, not completely off the arts and culture beat. So, but what, what am I going to do? Say no. I mean, there's, it, it, <laughs> it's, it's the story. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I mean, uh, the, the financial fortunes of the Tribune right now are, pretty much in the news anyway and uh, it's it's just it's the right thing to do now I'm working with people I just so admire because they've done this for years beautifully and they're just trying to get a, the rest of us up to speed but I'm in there with you know the architecture critic and <laughs> mm -hmm. the theater critic and I mean that that's what we're doing that's about half our work these days are the in terms of the flow of films being released I know a lot of them are being held are mm -hmm. we seeing some things trickle into, you know, things that might have had a theatrical release showing up, you know, on Amazon Prime or on, you know, streaming services quicker? A lot yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. There's been, yeah. But, you know, again, not those major 
studio movies. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Universal was smart to put Trolls out because that's aimed at children and people with families and it made sense. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to make sense with Wonder Woman or all the other block for the James Bond movie. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because that is a more of a big screen experience, whereas children are used to watching cartoons on, on a smaller screen. Mm -hmm. um, I work in the features department, so we I'm doing a lot more reporting, uh, gosh, about locations, can, talking to sales agents, talking to people that normally would now be packing their bags and getting ready to go to the south of France. Um, where are those movies going to go? Nobody is quite sure. Mm -hmm. um, there, Toronto and about 20 other film festivals are going to have a virtual festival. Oh, gosh, when is that? At the end of May, yeah. I believe it is. Yeah. Is there a chance that some of them could actually make more money that way because they're more, they, uh, they're casting the net wider in terms of being able to find an audience? People wouldn't necessarily be able to go to the south of France, could buy a ticket, or they, or their limitations? Well, a lot of those films that go to the, fest, the Cannes Festival, they, they don't have distributors already. Right. So, um, yeah. and the ones that do have distri distributors are, they have prescribed plans. Uh, mm -hmm. This is PAX award season at the end of the year. Um, it's like a whole bunch of dominoes. You don't have can, so what's going to happen with Venice? Probably nobody's going to go. Venice says they're going to happen. Who wants to go to Venice, uh, you know, mm -hmm. at the end of August? I mean. Doesn't, doesn't, no. seem, doesn't seem safe to me. Yeah, from here. yeah. Right. right. So you have all these dominoes uh, that get thrown down because can's not happening. And what does that mean for distribution in the fourth quarter? A lot of these movies are not going to go out on more than 800 screens. So you have this bottleneck of movies. Are they just going to hold to another year and go for, because awards, is so important to a lot of these smaller movies. Mm -hmm, yeah. It's just a, it's just like a whole lot of moving parts right now in the film business. Um, personally, I, I I think that a lot of those the Academy just changed their eligibility yesterday, and they said you can you don't have to play in a theater for a week in Los Angeles or New York. Mm -hmm. You can just be online. Uh, as long as you make your film available to Academy members through their own streaming service. Um, so that's huge. That, mm -hmm. That's huge for these little movies, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so last year, if that had happened, Bird Box might have gotten Best Picture. <laughs> 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 to, to your point, Lou, about movies that I think would, would get a, a bigger audience because of this, or that maybe, maybe I just even hope would get a bigger audience because of this. I think of a movie like Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always, uh, mm -hmm. that, yeah. that, opened, that opened, I believe, the weekend before everything just kind mm -hmm. of shut down. Um, one, of, one of my favorite movies from this year so far, um, Universal, through Focus, put it on, uh, on demand for a, a 1999 rental for 48 hours. I think they've since cut that down to nine ninety nine. I think that you know my, my hope is um, you know people see that and read about it and think you know well okay I you know I'm, I'm going to take a gamble on this. I think I think people are more likely to take the you know it's sort of like mm -hmm. the um, you know it, it's sort of like the, uh, the the Netflix scrolling problem, right? I mean uh, <laughs> decision paralysis. Maybe they'll just say okay we're going to try this. I read you know, I read Michael's review of this, or I, you know, I heard good things about this film. I'm going to, I'm going to check this out. And, and, you know, going back to the babysitter and the, and the arrangements there, I mean, it's, it's, it's less of an investment. It's just less of a financial a investment. Of you saved a right. lot of popcorn. Right. I mean, so, so my hope is that for some of those films that, you know, do have distributors or that, or that, you know, were in the pipeline that, that they can maybe find more of an audience and maybe more of a, um, a foothold. Uh, you know, in whatever the whatever the viewing world looks like looks like now. So, some yeah. of the uh, do a quick uh, a quick lightning round. Some of the films that have been brought up. If anyone wants to chime in with any thoughts or opinions on any of these that folks in the chat have brought up, uh, Morning Glory with Rachel McAdams and Harrison Ford and Diane Keaton. Yeah, kind of a near miss. I didn't see it. <laughs> 
Yeah, my memory is that it was a near miss. It was just frustrating because I think McAdams is first rate and she she could she can basically do anything, I think. And and uh that film is just sort of a soft, indecisive, you know, occasional digs at, you know, TV and morning television priorities and all that. I, I didn't and I think there's a I, the audience is not necessarily always right, but I think in that case they were. They, people just didn't have a strong response to it either way, so me neither. <laughs> the Soloist, <laughs> another one allegedly based on a true story, but obviously oh, it's pretty yeah. weird. Damn. <laughs> it was, they felt, talk about hooey. I mean, I mean, you don't even have to know the real reporter, Steve Lopez, or the real story oh, to kind of yeah. that that was one that, that also tried to be about three different movies all at once none of them terribly good so yeah, yeah. Uh, I, man. I thought the sanctum the san, you know it's it's I, I just don't like stories that are well essentially trying to tell two stories as you're saying but maybe made in a movie yeah. more, but you know where the where the 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 white journalism story trumps the African. It's just you know, it's just it's the racial optics blow in that movie. It's just, it's so <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, the ugly side. That was something like Natural Born Killers. I, I hated that movie. I, I can't. I, I can't even go there. I hate it. Hated that movie so much. I, <laughs> I had my. It Listen, gave, me, I, gave me a migraine. I haven't watched it since, although I do have it as part of some big Oliver Stone omnibus collection. I, I've never watched it again. So uh, it, there's no reason to. I, I, just, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't I, even I don't want to go. Say, I don't want to say you could trace the pandemic back to that film. But I, I'm not saying you couldn't. <laughs> Um, Something like going to the colossal bombs that there was high hopes for bonfire of the vanities. Oh, my God. I just watched that again because I saw it was on the list. Yeah. And it's just as bad as it was when it first came out. I, and I, I I thought the book was terrific, but God, just that opening opening scene. It's like, what is going on here? And why is he, I don't, oh, there's so much wrong with that. It's just, it's, it's stunning. Yeah, every decision wrong. It's, <laughs> it's, every, <laughs> If I'm mean, one of the better uh, making of books, Devil's oh, King, yeah. uh, about the making of that film, if you like, yeah. behind the scenes, how, how, how messes happen. Lou, yeah, I, oh, yeah. Lou, I saw on the, on the, uh, on the uh, poll that just came up, it's best, best, flat out best newspaper movie of all time. And we haven't talked about Citizen Kane, which is on uh, that poll. And I mean, I'm just going to bring that up. Is, is that, I, I talked to so many people who know it's supposed to be, you know, the greatest film of all time and are like, eh, on it. The, is, is Citizen Crane as great as its reputation? Well, yes. And, yeah. and it's, it's been fighting, it's been fighting the, this lavish praise, you know, its entire uh, career since it came out in 41. And, and it, it's, it's not strictly speaking a newspaper film. Hmm. And it's, it's about a, a, you know, a callow, uh, and finally kind of a lonely for somewhat tragic figure who you know part of the fun he had was running one of these things mm. and and it's just it, it's it, that film just astonishes me anew every time I mean for, as much for every every decision about how it's going to work visually as it is what it's saying you know quote unquote um, I, I it's it's the least of the journal it's the least journalism -y of these four that make the best journalism film poll results. So between Spotlight, All the President's Men, and His Girl Friday, which is at zero percent, I'm, I'm determined to get His Girl Friday in this race. I'm gonna... <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going we're gonna to wrap things up at an hour here. First, I want to let people know, uh, to find out about other webinars and more SPJ activities, including a wealth of coronavirus resources, please visit uh, spj.org. Uh, this is an extremely difficult time for journalists, obviously, with news outlets closing, freelance jobs becoming scarcer. Journalists continue to report even without the promise of a paycheck, sometime knowing that keeping you informed is the best way to overcome the pandemic. Uh, on, on April 30th, uh, if you are listening to this before then, uh, you can help SPJ create its Journalists Emergency Fund, which will directly support journalists facing financial hardship. If you're able, please make a gift at spj.org slash dayofgivingback.asp. 
Um, any le movies that we haven't mentioned that you'd like to just throw into the conversation before we uh, before we close? Nick, what's a movie um, you brought up? What's a movie we haven't brought up? Um, well, I mean, I, I think there's two more broadcast ones, um, kind of two sides of the same coin in a lot of ways, Network and Christine. Uh, mm -hmm. There were two oh. films, obviously not the demonic car, Stephen King, <laughs> Christine, <but laughs> Christine Chubbuck, uh, uh, biopic Christine. Um, you know, I think that as we look at, you know, especially again in 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 current times, we see the mental health toll on people. Um, you know, uh, you know, working at the very forefront of, of of combating this pandemic, and I think that you know those are very real issues too. That um, you know that perhaps one to a more sensational degree than the other, those two films address the you know the um, the the complexities of of. The personalities and the frailty sometimes of the of, of the mental health um, mm -hmm. that, that that can that can result from mm -hmm. that. So, Carol, do you have uh, anything we haven't mentioned? Um, the interview. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, timely, you know, timely again as well, right? <laughs> I tell you, you know, yeah. At the the very beginning, um, you know. I get that a lot at Variety. Oh, it's not real journalism because, I mean, you get that internally too. People have, uh, we have inferiority complexes because we're not covering, you know, more date or whatever. Um, but, um, you know, we are covering the entertainment business and gosh, that really hit home. At the very, And I like those, I like Seth Rogen. He's funny <laughs> and it, you know, it spins out of control and nobody takes notes and, Anyway, but it's just, it just cracks me up. <laughs> Very good. Michael? You know what film I really love? I really love Capote. Uh, and that's, it's oh, not yeah. really a journalism film, but it's, it's a non-fiction, non-fiction you know, reporting film, I guess you call it. Just because it's, you know, Capote and Harper Lee trying to get the story that turns into In Cold Blood. And that, that I, I find that very, very sharp about how it plays Capote's uh, strengths and weaknesses uh, right down the middle. So you're left with a very ambiguous and pretty troubling portrait of a, a guy who got the story but kind of lost his career. It's, you know, simple description, but uh, that, I love mm. Ben and Miller's film, Capote. Yeah, yeah that's also good. One. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for being a part of this. So I think Nick Rogers from Midwest Film Journal, Carol Horst from Variety, and Michael Phillips from the Chicago Tribune. Find them all at various websites and <laughs> Twitter handles and all of that. Follow them, pay attention to what they're talking about. Good stuff. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank, Thank you, Lou. Thanks, Lou. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.